Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, for our discussion about desktop transformation today. The two presenters in the room are uh, Jim Zaksewski and Richard Primo. We are uh, part of the ClearCube marketing department. And uh, today, we're going to assume some of you are listening to this talk are in the process of technology refreshes or are trying to determine exactly how to embrace desktop transformation. Our goal today is to provide you with good factual information to help you decide the best course for your organization and to give you some data points to help make your case for justifying a desktop transformation to the other influencers and co-decision makers around you. Richard? Today's talk is going to weave around the following storyline. Searching for security vulnerabilities within your organization, helping you to clearly identify the biggest attack surface. We're going to painfully dwell on the vulnerabilities we see every day, and we will take you further through those vulnerabilities and quantify them for you. We hope you'll see that the lowest hanging fruit is overripe and how most, most vulnerabilities can be eradicated with desktop transformation. We'll show you that ClearCube platforms secure data and dramatically alter the security posture of our customers. And hopefully, uh, we'll answer most of your questions during the presentation, but we encourage you to uh, type those, those questions in, and we'll get to them at the end of the uh, presentation. First, let's have a sip of stats. You know, what, what's a webinar without st a stat slide? So here are some that we found that are representative of the, uh, the mess that most organizations are in. 87% of organizations have experienced a security breach in the last 12 months. When we created this slide, the uh, statistic was 126 rise in acknowledgments of cyber attacks. As of yesterday, that number has grown to 144% in a report that was just released. And 70% trace the loss of intellectual property to a removable storage device. And the latest numbers out are that the U.S., the estimated cost of losses for the United States businesses for stolen IP has now reached $200 billion, $250 billion. However, of all the damage that a cyber attack can cause, the most devastating is the loss of intellectual property, including trade secrets. In fact, in a recent Fortune 1000 study, the loss of intellectual property is ranked as the most negative consequence, with respondents rating at an average of 9.2 out of 10 in terms of severity. So that got us to thinking about common vulnerabilities and exposures, and we wanted to identify some of them for you. The layer of enterprise security that is both the hardest and the easiest to get under control is the endpoint. Today, that endpoint is still primarily the distributed desktop computer, and with it come two primary attack vectors, network access and physical access. Gardner Group summed it up. They said, it's the traditional desktop endpoint devices that cause most of the headaches for the security folks. But the key deduction that goes unsaid in that statement is that the quote-unquote killer underlying problem is having the data and the applications distributed locally. That's right, Jim. Local data is the Achilles heel of IT infrastructure. And for the next 30 to 40 minutes, we're going to keep harping on how big these vulnerabilities are because many of your organizations need to realize that as big as these problems are, Imagine how big the relief will be when they're gone. We think the gem of this entire talk will be your confident realization that they do go away with one simple practical decision. So, but before you experience the relief, the pain has to come first. In 2014, Fortune 1000 organizations experienced a 29 increase in PC security incidents involving malware and viruses a 35% rise in IT help desk support requests. That's very costly. And over the past 12 months, 54%, over half, report that 50% or half of their reported PC incidents require a physical desk side visit by IT help staff. And 80% of all network security compromises 
occur at the device desktop device level. I think that uh, when you start taking a look at the way this slide builds, the most salient one is the one in the middle. Managing endpoint desktop environments is the most manpower intensive aspects of all the DOD IT operations and defense. That uh, the little quote from the DOD CIO uh, kind of puts a cost associated with just one aspect. One of the costs associated with this in the Pentagon alone, they spent $100 million last year fighting malware. Let's, take, let's break those vulnerabilities down just a little bit further. On the network access side, we have three large buckets of activities which each have their own vulnerabilities or large areas of exposure. Each of these have a liability and a cost associated with them. On the network access side, we're looking at the anti-malware management, patch management, configuration management, and all of those have extreme costs attached to them. On the physical access side, we're really looking at the device control, the user access control, and the port control on the device. And it, as you will hear from us, this turns out to be the leaky faucet at the edge. The other uh, real area of vulnerability is that you have local data, and that means you've got to have application control, and you've got to have data control. Unfortunately, the same network access issues and the same physical access issues exist with the laptop computers. We're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about these vulnerabilities and the same local data access there at the laptops, but they have one thing that's worse than all, and that is the laptops walk away. Jim, let's talk about asset management for a second. Asset management IT security threats are decreased by understanding what you have, understanding how it's being used, where it's being used, who's using it, and when it's being used. This seems obvious, but before you can protect something from virus or, ma or malware, configure it or patch it, you have to know it exists, where the device is, and who has possession of it. This task is a burden that is growing as more devices enter the picture. The statistics that we found were astounding. When you take a look at a recent DHS, Inspector General study, they found an inability to account for 20 to 30 percent of the devices that they had purchased. That 20 percent of devices have incorrect user information, and they calculated there could potentially be a billion dollar savings in software licenses with improved asset management. In the same study, regarding configuration and patch management, they found that 95 percent of devices are missing high-risk security patches for more than six months. You can see that people just decide to delay uh, applying patches because they come out very often, they're troublesome, there's a tremendous amount of work involved, there's pain involved, so people just try, you know, they basically ignore them. So um, the other thing we found is that um, uh, well, okay, so there's some, there's some information at the bottom that talks about uh, dollars, but what's interesting is that one of the audits that was done uh, over at the VA year after year and has now uh, climbed to 16 consecutive years is that the VA has failed its annual cybersecurity audit. So they are representative, or they're just one representative example of what the government is dealing with today. And, and not really to pile on, I want to tell you a story about one organization, and I'm not going to name the organization, but this agency's painful experiences as told by an Office of the Inspector General's uh, investigation, unfortunately it appears to be more the norm than the exception. It focuses on laptops, but we're going to, it, while the story focuses on laptops, we're going to talk a little bit more about laptops in a minute, but the story is not about the laptops. The problem is found in all distributed computers. So this agency has 10,000 full-time employees that have enrolled in the CAC Remote Access Service Program. Okay, so that means that they're supposed to comply 
with all the FISMA directives. Now, the uh, Inspector General found that, that, that the organization had not implemented effective security controls on, on its laptops at all. It had not implemented the required DHS and federal configuration settings. 13 plus missing critical and high risk security patches that were more than six months old were on 95% of the laptops tested. They had not developed the proper procedures to erase and render sensitive data stored on the laptop hard drives were unrecoverable and they recycled these laptops. They went into other organizations or agencies. Sometimes they were donated to the community and they were found to have data still on the hard drives. So having not configured its laptops with all the required settings to maintain an effective and standardized baseline of security on all these Windows workstations and laptops is a pervasive problem throughout the entire federal government. I could regale you with tale after tale of these laptop inventory missing stats in the 17 to 26 percent range, but remember that this was a 10,000 possible remote laptop users and the scrutiny was performed on 6,000 of those laptops. So performance and the problem is huge and the laptops are very costly. Again, we're talking about laptops as being representative of an endpoint, a vulnerable endpoint. And what we're going to do is try to draw the parallels between a lot of the environments that you work in, whether you have laptops or you have distributed PCs. Many of these vulnerabilities or most of these vulnerabilities are applicable to both. Uh, just a few more statistics about these laptops because they are, it's just amazing when you start taking a look at the numbers. 42% of organizations reported laptop theft. 7% of all the assigned laptops will be lost or stolen over a three-year life, lifetime. That is predictable. And it's even worse in the public sector. Almost 100% of those laptops that are lost or stolen are never recovered. And they put, a, they put a dollar figure on this and they come up with the fact that if you lose a laptop to the cost of the organization is about $50,000. And they attribute 80% of that value to the cost incurred in the data that has been lost on that laptop. On average, 15.8% of all security incidents reported to the federal government involve lost or stolen equipment. And it's a lot worse for others. But what I want to do, uh, if you take a look at this slide right here, the, rather than jump into all the statistics, what it really illustrates is that loss or theft of equipment is across all departments. It's not isolated to anyone in particular. And what it represents on a larger scale is that data has gone missing with every piece of missing equipment. So let's, let's press on to the uh, additional vulnerabilities. We start talking about uh, patch management. And when we, again, started looking at statistics, we found that 15% of the Fortune 1000 were lacking readiness for software audits. In conversations that we've been having with customers, uh, the, the increase in visibility or, or worry about security breaches has really increased the number of, of uh, audits that, that take place in an organization. And you start thinking about the pain associated with a software audit. And if, uh, if you've got, as an example, 200 distributed PCs around your office area and you were asked to do a information assurance audit at each desktop, you'd have to ask yourself which would be easier, going from desktop to desktop, from person to person, to each individual device, or would you rather go to one place where those are all centralized? That's what's alluded to when you start getting down to that quote from the Pentagon Army VDI uh, comment at the bottom. He says, instead of having to do security updates and patches on every one, you really only need to do it one time on the back end. I don't think I need to explain how significant that is in terms of operations and maintenance 
of our IT systems out there. And, and that's the theme of where we're going with this discussion, is how to move those assets and resources to the data center where you can manage them and where you can go to bed at night and not worry about them. Let's talk about access. ClearCube was the first zero client provider to integrate a multi-voltage smart card reader. And throughout these next couple of slides, you're going to get a sense of how helpful that is when you examine how the adoption of PKI and two-factor authentication has become. You can really feel how useful it is when you look at the user universe size. We now uh, have a, a Nippernet active tax are around 3.8 million users, and Cipernet is at 4.2 million users. Some of the data that, that we found, we, we are always looking at how to improve the security posture of the edge. And some of the recent data that came across, we were trying to look at this universe, 5.6 million people have access to at least some classified information. And 1.1 million are private contractors with more than one-fifth of all cleared workers have access to confidential and secret government information. And of those, about 500,000 contractors work with the most secure top secret information. Now, I'm going to show you a slide that is, uh, was released in uh, May of 2014. It, it shows you that this universe is huge, and it will show you how much bigger it's going to get. The blue here means that the PKI has been issued but has not yet been implemented to be required for network access. You can look at Treasury, for example. Nuclear Regulatory is another one. Um, Department of Homeland Security, Justice, these departments have a long way to go, and having these integrated CAC cards and smart card readers at the edge is going to become more and more and more commonplace. And why is that so important? Because insiders are your biggest threat. You know, no one likes to hear this, but if you deny this fact, you're going to get Snowdened. I just want to repeat just a few of those numbers for you. Again, we're talking millions, 3.8 million Nippernet users, 4.2 Cipernet users. So when you think of the number of people, the population that has access to these insider connections, uh, you realize that one of the most uh, prevalent threats that you have may be sitting next to you. So uh, when, you, when you take a look at the insider portion of it, most of the world's enterprises are focused on protecting networks from the outside, from malware and hackers, but the bigger risk is really from the inside. 75% of organizations have suffered data loss from negligent or malicious insiders. So, how, you know, how does this happen? Well, Maybe you're guilty of it. I know in a, case, a couple of cases, I know I've been guilty of it. Bringing work home via personal email accounts or sneaker netting data out on a USB drive or accidentally these things happen as sending sensitive information actually gets sent to the wrong recipient. I don't know if you've ever done it, but you, you may be clicking through your email and you may have seven gyms in a row. And I know my... I know I've, every once in a while I've made a mistake of clicking on the wrong email and having to apologize for it. These are just common human mistakes that, get ha that, that happen. There's mistakes by systems administrators and programmers, misconfigured settings that cause sensitive data to be stored insecurely or exposed to unauthorized parties. 35% 35, 35 of end users routinely make a conscious decision to violate corporate security policies. Why? Because they want to expedite their work and increase their productivity, so they do, they do their own work around. More than 80% of large enterprises show at least some network activity from Google applications. And virtually all large enterprises experience unauthorized applications in use by their employees, loaded onto their networks, possibly brought in on laptops. You know, it just happens. Now, USB drives aren't bad. They just have to be controlled by training, by policy, and good solutions because when they don't, when they are not in control, they can cause you problems, and that's why they've earned the nickname Ultimate Security Breakdown instead of uh, what we know as Universal Serial Bus. 
Microsoft recently did a study of 600 million systems worldwide, and that study revealed that 26% of all malware infections of Windows systems were due to USB flash drives exploiting the auto run feature. And 70% of businesses have traced the loss of sensitive or confidential information to these memory sticks. Remember, it's held that, one, that the way Snowden uh, removed all the data from the NSA was on USB sticks. And 55% of the incidents are related to the insider use, even the, I mean, the unwitting use of malware-infected devices that have introduced malicious code onto the corporate networks. So the USB device is the most successful interface in the history of the PC, and we better face it and we better embrace it with the proper controls and solutions. So now we get to mass storage. Now the challenge is balancing usefulness with protection. You want to be able to use these devices if possible. Um, but, you know, valuable information, things like trade secrets, source code, customer information, all can be removed at the PC endpoint. There are many leak points and insiders, and the consequences can get very expensive. One of the uh, largest efforts to gain control can also be very painful, costly, and resource consuming. So let's talk a little bit about compliance. Sometimes compliance is a contractual is contractual, as in a customer SLA, very prevalent in the media and entertainment industry and in the uh, architecture, uh, construction, and engineering uh, enterprises. Others, like the examples that we're going to talk about, are mandated by legislation or by some self-regulating community of interest policy and standards that are set in place. 75% of organizations must comply with two or more regulations and corresponding audits in the federal government. And like Jim introduced earlier, when this slide was built two days ago, 43% had to comply with three or more regulations. In the same study he referred to earlier, it's now 72% of federal agencies have reported that they have to comply with three or more regulations. And there's a 34% increase in investigations by worldwide governmental agencies. And the net of it all is every agency that is, uh, is uh, surveyed reports that they spend 30 to 50% more on compliance than they should have to. So that's been kind of a review of the attack vectors from the insider perspective and the physical attack vectors um, so although insiders are such a capital threat, it turns out that the lion's share of preventative investments, and this Jim alluded to this a second ago, most of the preventative investments have been to protect the network from outsiders. You always keep in mind that, that when you're thinking about outsiders, it turns out that 50% of what we classify as outsiders committing IT sabotage are really former insiders, former employees that regained access via back doors or corporate accounts that were never disabled. So now we're going to transition into uh, the technology portion of the presentation. We're going to talk a little bit about our desktop transformation vision and the one that's being adopted by um, government agencies all, uh, it, it's just there are numerous initiatives right now that are addressing this type of technology and, and we want to kind of point out why the adoption rate is going through the roof. Uh, last year, as an example, just from a high level, the number of zero clients that were sold into the marketplace exceeded one and a half million and the numbers are expected to double year after year for the foreseeable future. So, you know, you could see that you're as, as you start to examine this type of technology, it's starting to become more and more prevalent. You may, you may see it in agencies that you walk into. You may recognize these devices. And what we want to try to do is give you the uh, kind of the reasons why you can justify going in this kind of direction. So that Achilles heel that we talked about, that piece of vulnerability disappears when you make one simple decision, and that's to address the vulnerability with adopting zero clients. With zero clients, there's no more distributed data. 
all the data resides in the data center. And the burden of managing and protecting the edge virtually disappears. We we talked about the uh, the management uh, overheads and the management pain that goes along with distributed PCs. That goes away. So let's clearly establish all the zeros of the zero client. I won't go through that whole list, but a zero client basically is gets its name because there's nothing. There's almost nothing there. No operating system, no CPU, no memory, no storage, and all the rest of that stuff. And and the the, the bottom line is it, it translates into the most secure desktop endpoint device on the market. So remember the attack vectors. I'm bringing them back here to the screen because with the zero client, they just fall away. No more configuration management issues. No more patch management issues. No more anti uh, virus or malware issues. The, the exception management, all of those 54% of incidents requiring desk side uh, intervention go away. There's no more worry about the local data, the data, the data walking away with a lost or stolen device. There's no more taking the hard drives out of the box and locking them up in a vault. There's no more com complicated application or data control. And with the zero clients, there are multiple layers of control over the USB ports. So ClearCube offers a hardware-based mass storage lockout on our Blade platforms, and our management consoles give you complete control over the USB ports. They can be on, they can be off based on certain conditions, they can be configured based on a myriad of different uh, algorithmic uh, access policies. The, uh, the underlying protocol for zero clients is PC over IP technology. And that protocol uh, compresses, it encrypts, and it encodes the entire computing experience at the data center. It transmits pixels only across a standard IP network to the zero client desktops. Data never leaves the data center. That's the key point, is that, uh, that all of those assets stay under your control inside the data center. PC over IP supports high resolution, full frame, 3D graphics and high definition media, multiple large displays, full USB peripheral connectivity and high definition audio. That sounds like a PC. It delivers all the functionality of a PC without having the PC there. So, and especially from the, the desktop computer experience, we have we have zero clients being attached to back-end, very, very powerful machines, and the experience running AutoCAD applications, Autodesk applications, high graphics applications, 3D rendering. Uh, you couldn't tell whether it was being done under your desk or whether it was being done in the data center. Zero clients also simplify the information assurance aspect of this. So for patch consistency, data containment, data recovery, uh, streamline network management and operations, all of that come along with the value of what a zero client is. And although the government CIOs don't really want to admit it publicly, confidentially they had admitted that the existing 193 Defense Department security directives and policy memorandum, that's 193, they're just not executable. There's too many of them. And because of this and the increased security and cyber attacks, the Department of Defense is actively pursuing programs to replace virtually all of their fat PC systems that are distributed out where the users are with thin or zero clients. For our government and DOD customers, the explicit benefits include a centrally managed standardized desktop device for every use case, improved security footing with complete control over the input devices, increased visibility of the computing assets and the software, improved availability and uptime to five nines, a simplified end user device with all the benefits that come with that. It, redu there, it will reduce software licensing costs. It will lengthen the life cycle. We even see the Department of Energy extending life cycle with zero clients to seven to ten years. It centralizes the control of all the technical refreshes that happen. 
That's a big burden, and it supports all the approved local peripheral devices. And again, the big push in the federal government is energy efficiency, and zero clients will provide you at least 55% greater energy efficiencies. I'm going to use this next diagram three times in the rest of this presentation, so I want to just explain the setup. On the left-hand side, we're sort of thinking about the traditional office, the uh, not a very complex desktop. And as we move across to the right side, we're talking about specialized desktop and administrative functions that have to be uh, performed. We break this into three categories, task user, knowledge user, power user. And I'm sure everybody's familiar with these terms. So as the innovator in zero client technology that ClearCube is, we have the largest selection of zero clients available that are tailor-made to every use case we've ever encountered, from the task users with very simple, budget-friendly uh, zero clients, all the way up to a specialized form factor for multiple level security access to the desktop. So we're going to continue to use this slide a little bit to show you how the rest of our solutions facilitate this desktop transformation, one vendor, a variety of solutions that are all tailor-made to move the desktops to the data center. So one more picture here where I'm looking at the traditional office and specialized environments. Again, desktop feature sets and then highly specialized and tailored feature sets. Most of the zero client manufacturers that we compete with, they, they make very simple devices that solve the problem quite beautifully for the traditional office environment and for very simple office feature sets. ClearCube, however, has specialized in these higher, uh, more unique use cases. We are very responsive to our customers, and as a, uh, as a result of that, we've been responsible for a whole plethora of marketplace firsts, including the first vendor for an integrated CAC reader, the first OEM to support the PC over IP from desktop to data center. We've introduced multiple Tempest level products. We've uh, introduced seven USB port device before those were available in the marketplace. We were the first Fiber Zero client, the first Quad Zero client, and we've just introduced a new product with six USBs and an integrated CAC card reader. So this, we have about 30 different models that are available, and there are many options depending on your network infrastructure, your display requirements, your need for authentication, your budget, your requirement for peripheral devices, and uh, other specialty multiple level security or Tempest uh, requirements. This is the latest one with four USB ports on the back, the integrated card reader, and then there are two more super speed USB ports on the back side. Yeah, one other thing I'd like to uh, bring up about that particular one. Richard, if you can go back a slide. Yes, sir. Um, we, we have customers who are used to having PCs at their desks, and they use them, they use the USB ports to actually charge their iPhone. So as we were going into the design on this, we actually had requests from customers who said, you know, the standard USB port at 500 milliamps um, will charge a phone, uh, but it doesn't, it doesn't happen as fast as I would like it to. What can you do? And so what we did is, in this particular design, there is a higher powered peripheral, USB peripheral support on this, uh, on this model that will support uh, point-of-sale device, uh, we're, we're, we're looking at a number of folks that use barcode readers. You know, these zero clients are getting deployed all over the place, uh, retail locations, commissaries, all sorts of places. And in, in cases like that, they may have uh, cash register interfaces. They may have other types of USB peripherals that you don't normally see uh, on the zero client side, but you do see on the PC side. So. We built special designs into a lot of these zero clients to address those special use cases. The one we're going to transition to is a very, very popular one for us because I'm sure it's a popular one uh, for you, and that is the multiple level security uh, aspect of the environments that we sell into. Uh, DOD uh, is a huge, huge customer of ClearCubes, has been for a long, long time, 
And when you start thinking about migrating um, distributed desktops to the data center, the most, most painful example, we're going to show you very, very painful examples of places that we've been and taken pictures of, uh, showing you just what a mess it is in, in a lot of these uh, operations caused by the fact that all of that distributed computing uh, exists where it exists. So what we ended up doing is we ended up addressing that by creating a, a series of, of uh, products that couple a variety of zero clients, whichever variety, you, copper, fiber, quad, dual, you know, we can combine any of all of them together into united uh, or unified piece of equipment that is uh, very, very compact, very clean, and, um, uh, and, you know, easy to manage and easy to install. So we're going to get into a little bit about what this multiple level uh, desktop environment is around. The use of multiple computers is a fact of life for many in the military. Uh, they need separate, secure access to multiple networks, applications, and services. And all are driven by security. Intelligence and defense analysts are just some of the larger groups of these multi-computing systems. And the challenges range from annoying, noisy, cramped, cluttered, overheated workspaces to cabling issues and significant energy inefficiencies. PCs keep getting added to the networks. So when you have a new task and a new application and a new network and a new security policy, guess what you end up with? A new computer shoved under the desk. We have worked with uh, a couple of Air Force bases in the command and control centers where there are as many as 12 separate network drops going into 12 separate PCs under one poor person's desk. So we've seen the worst of the worst. Uh, usually the way they, they address this is by combining these multiple computers with a KVM switch uh, on their desk. So KVMs sometimes tip on the desktops because they're weighted down with so many cables. If you have one operator who has four computers, the KVM will end up having 10 video cables, four audio cables, and the cabling for the mouse and the keyboard and the smart card reader, and that becomes a rat's nest to have around your desk. So um, Richard will show you some examples. So in this situation, we're looking at these, these two uh, analysts, and we've got two PCs on one side of the, the gentleman on the right. He's got two PCs on his right, two PCs on his left side, You've got a VoIP phone, analog phone. The gentleman on the left's got another phone in his hand. And you've got red, green, blue, and white networks all dropping into each of these cubicles. And this is common. Here's another example of how pervasive this problem is. You've got this lady who's sitting at a desk, a six-foot table it looks like, and she's got seven PCs surrounding her. And if I took this picture, where, where I got this extraction from is actually about a 80,000 square foot forward operating base, and every inch of the space in this facility looks exactly like this, except the supervisor's area, which I stopped counting his PCs at 32. So it is very much a common problem, and we felt their pain, so that's where the family came from. This is the Client Cube family. There's a Client Cube 2, there's the secure KVM. You can combine dual fiber display zero clients with copper quad display zero clients, integrated TAC on a fiber zero client, the KM on the other side, any kind of combination you'd like. We've got the new, uh, the new zero client fits right into this form factor. And then on the lower uh, left-hand side of the screen, even when this small form factor, there's not enough room on the desk, there are ways to put this form factor under the desk and just bring forward a remote desktop control unit. We'll show you another picture of that here in just a second. So if you take a look at the problem we're addressing, we actually have uh, in the upper right-hand corner, you're looking at four independent multiple security domains. And those four are brought to the desk 
through four individual network drops into the individual uh, zero clients. They are joined inside that little box through some very short uh, cables. So we try to keep the clutter to a very, you know, to a, to a minimum. It's all self-contained. And they are connected to a secure KVM switch. The switch operates in a, and actually there's two, two choices. The switch operates like a standard KVM switch. And as Richard alluded to, you can actually remote the buttons to your desk to save uh, even more valuable desk space if, if you want to. But um, when you switch, when you push a button on uh, the uh, KVM switch itself, you are basically switching to the network that you want to select. Those video outputs are then brought to the screen. There is a second type of switch that we have, which is called a KM. And in that particular case, the video is persistent, which means that each one of those zero clients has a full-time output to the screen. So you never lose visibility of what's going on. If you're, if you're running a watch floor, for instance, we have these in Navy watch floors where they're doing video surveillance. They're taking a look at um, camera feeds. They're looking at um, uh, satellite feeds and a number of other things. And they don't have the luxury, if you will, to be able to switch away from any one network. The KM allows you to have persistent video coming out of each of the zero clients, but as you move your keyboard, excuse me, as you move your mouse from display to display, it switches as well as your keyboard to the network that you want to interact with. Uh, so that's, that's just one more of the products within our family. And there's another picture of the control unit, a little bit uh, closer view of that. The last zero client we're going to talk about, and we're almost done here, so we appreciate you staying with us. The presentation is just a few more slides, and we'll be wrapping this up. I'm, I'm actually going to just talk at a very high level. One of the other uh, specialty zero clients we offer is a Tempest certified zero client. And for those of you who aren't familiar with it, I'll just say it, it is a way of shielding all of the equipment at the desktop, the zero client, the cables, the display, the keyboard, so that any of the radio frequency interference or electromagnetic inter interference, these are all blocked by different levels of shielding. And um, the, typically you find these in NATO environments, in the uh, embassies overseas, on ships. Very special use case for these. The whole system is tested and certified through uh, an, an NSA-approved uh, testing facility. And as I said, the traditional customers are a pretty unique case. Um, there are a couple of th these are the kinds of uh, requirements that are met. So you'll, you'll see a requirement for these things, and that means that's a Tempest product. So all, all this really means, let me wrap it up real quick for you, is level one means you're stopping the eavesdropper that's looking over your shoulder at about one meter. Level two means the uh, eavesdropper looking over your fence, uh, about 20 meters protection. And then level three, level C, is 100 meters. That foils the van in the parking lot that you see in all the movies that are trying to listen in to, to your EMI signals. So that's Tempest. If you have a requirement for Tempest, we're the guys to call. So that's the partial close to the zero client discussion. And the, uh, the angels are singing. I'm sure you can hear them. The data is in the data center, and the world is a much safer place. So let's talk about what drives the back end. So um, do you want me to? No, you're, you're good. This yeah. is smart BDI. Yeah, OK. So um, ClearCube has a complete family of traditional VDI platforms called Smart VDI. They range from our basic non-persistent link clone VMs to virtualization using RDS to highly available Smart VDI architectures and our specialty for the more complex persistent full clone needing enhanced GPUs for visualization incorporating uh, the grid adapters. The next picture shows how they compare to one another on user density Again, we're not going to get into all the, the details here, but there's a lot of decisions that have to be made as to what the best solution is going to be for you. Um, and, and what we want to really get across is that the zero client 
that we've been focused on in terms of transforming your desk is the same exact Xero client that connects either to a virtual machine or a physical ClearCube Blade PC in the data center. So you have the, the capability to be able to apply the right tool to, to solve the problem that you are trying to solve. Not, not everybody can virtualize. We're, we're, we're running into a number of applications, homegrown applications. We're running into um, uh, certain kinds of languages that uh, applications were developed in. We're running into high graphics demand areas that uh, don't, don't play well in shared environments. Blade PCs are perfect for those kind of applications. And the cool thing about it is that a zero client can broker a connection. It can route itself to either a virtual machine or to a dedicated physical machine. And this is one of the uniquenesses that ClearCube brings to the market is that we have both sides of the fence covered for you. So the, uh, the purpose of our, of our discussion today really wasn't to talk much about that. But if you have questions about um, the back end, uh, obviously give us a call, please. And, and, and I, want, I guess while we're talking about this, I want to talk a little bit about that term broker that I used. When you think about distributed PCs, that means that you have a PC that is, is, is tethered. It's, a, it's physical and it's in a location that, that, is, that is fixed. With a zero client, the connection is brokered, which means that you can access your PC in the data center from multiple places on your network. It allows you the ability to go up on the third floor, access it from that zero client, go down to the basement from a conference room, and it gives you that mobility, and you're always routing back to that one resource. So it's, it's, a, it's a hidden benefit that a lot of people don't take into account. We're seeing some, some really good questions coming up, and I want to make sure we have time to get to those. So I'm going to show you this one diagram one more time, and we'll let you know that we do have a full range. When the smart VDI platform, when the applications can't be virtualized and you need the special, uh, the special CPU and GPU power where you need to transition to a one-to-one, -one, you'll still get all of the same benefits of virtualization in a centralized environment. We've got multiple platforms that are uh, available for you to explore, and we'll be more than happy to take you through these to find out which collection of these solutions you might need for your, uh, for your specific organization. So again, I'm showing you here where data space is a premium. You've got the dense solutions. And as your performance uh, needs get higher, you have the different uh, form factors, the R series, the A series, and our engineering workstation platforms, multiple options there, uh, are all available to solve your problems to satisfy your end users. And one of the things I'd like to point out is that we have very, very technical sales staff, and we have a very technical systems engineering group who can help you decide the, or, or identify the decision points that, that will determine what's the best, most cost-effective, and most high-performance a combination for you. We don't need to get into a whole lot of uh, the benefits of Blade PCs, but some of these, as you, as you start to take a look at the screen, seem to be um, you know pretty obvious because they're all data center uh, benefits. So you can take a quick glance at those. Obviously, um, security is the biggest part of this presentation we're doing today, and with all the assets locked up in the data center, PCs included, we've addressed those. So, Jim, uh, we should, we should, I would have liked to have had this slide a little bit earlier because you were spot on when you were describing the benefits of brokering. Um, this kind of puts it into a picture so that you could see that no matter what your use case, no matter what zero client you're using, no matter what back-end smart BDI or one of our blade form factors, we've got the solution for you. In this case, I'm showing you 75 task users. I'm showing you 13 knowledge users using different display configurations, uh, stepping up to knowledge users using smart VDI with higher resolution displays. And I see we've got a question about displays. We're going to answer that in just a second. When you get into the A series form factor, we need to bring in the NVIDIA GPU cards, uh, quad display, zero clients. Uh, then we get into the designers, 
who you need like a K4200. And then the last group on the highest end of the high, the Quadro K6000 users that need a Fiber Zero client, all of that can be resident in, in, a, in a unified solution, all managed by our central management console. One of the other aspects that we haven't alluded to, and it's a mixed environment as well, is we have a number of customers that combine the Windows and Linux environments. And uh, we, we have uh, the Zero client, we have brokering capability to be able to broker a Linux connection into our Blade PCs as well. So um, uh, that isn't a, a hurdle either. That's not an obstacle for us either. So because we have uh, some questions I really want to get to, I, I'm just going to put this slide up here for you to, to look at. If you are interested, you can get copies of this presentation, no problem whatsoever. But this slide is there because middle of last year, end of last summer, the Army put forth their uh, master document articulating their uh, zero client architecture that they had embraced. And as you read through this incredible document that basically makes the same case that we've made all throughout this pitch, they have a summary slide. And their summary slide of benefits is that the zero client's ability to standardize and centralize management increase their mission effectiveness, their security, and their IT asset visibility in such a way that they have very tangible cost benefits. And uh, if you are interested in hearing more about that, just give us a call. I can take you through that study and show you how they will they saved millions of dollars just by virtualizing, just by putting zero clients on 80% of the Pentagon's 18,000 PCs. So give us a call if you want to hear the rest of that story. So I want to end our time today with just the, something my grandfather said that's always stuck with me. And he says, the only problems you have are the ones you haven't solved yet. And if you've got a security problem, it starts at the edge, and the IT security battle is going to be won by those who take care of the edge device and secure that. We have a, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. We, we have a couple of minutes left, so what I'd like to do, we, we have questions popping up. Uh, the first question says, what would be the maximum video data rate the system is capable of? That's, that's an interesting question uh, because what ha actually happens with this PC over IP technology is we are sending pixels across the connection. So from a, we can address it in two ways. Um, the actual resolution that can be supported uh, on a PC over IP connection is as many as four 1920 by 1200 monitors or two dual high link or uh, dual link high res 30 inch monitors on the endpoint. As far as frame rate goes, it supports up to a 60, uh, 60 frames per second if you have a Blade PC. Uh, the performance on virtual machines is nowhere near as good. But uh, when you start getting into the higher uh, performance graphics areas, uh, that's where our sweet spot is with Blade. So um, I think I took care of that yeah. one. The next question is, will the system maintain separation, different proprietary information? This, was, this question came up when we were talking about the, uh, the client Fine cubes. cubes. Yeah. So you want to take that one? Sure. sure. So um, what... What is happening on a client cube is that the actual data separation remains inside of the network operating center. Uh, if, you know, if you've been in any one of these secure knocks, you go in and you know that there is separation of racks, there is, there is dictated amount of space that has to happen between classified and unclassified networks and from, from certain classified networks and other classified networks. That remains as is. There's no change in that. So if you've got servers, for instance, set up on separate domains, in this particular case, your desktop uh, infrastructure will be set up in those same racks as that, and they are, they are completely separated. What comes out to the desktop is our four or two, three, four, however many individual network runs that coalesce into the uh, into the zero clients, and then I mean they're individually brought into each individual zero client, and then the keyboard, the video, and the mouse is the only shared device, and that's only done through a NIAP-approved, EAL-certified secure KVM switch. So 
this this is a, a very very common uh, type of adoption throughout uh, the DoD for us. This is a good question because we've just solved this problem. Are, are there any plans to include more than four systems into one device with a KVM? The daisy chaining of the KVMs? Yeah, actually we have a l very large project right now um, that has to do with driving uh, six individual uh, large displays. And what we have the ability to do is we can actually daisy chain a KM and a KVM switch together. So we have two client cubes involved, six individual network drops being brought in, and one keyboard and mouse being able to operate and jump between those environments. Uh, it's, it's really cool. It's a very unusual use, uh, use case, but you know it's it's a tough problem to solve. Shannon, I know we're at the last second. We just want to thank everyone for staying with us through the presentation. Um, Jim and I have uh, enjoyed being here, and uh, we'll take care of any of the other questions that come through uh, offline. We'll be uh, absolutely certain to get back with you. Shannon, it's all yours.